All right, it is seven o'clock, so I am going to get this started. Hello and welcome everybody to our fifth uh, session for the Heifer Management webinar series through Heifer Academy at Michigan State University Extension. I'm your host, Cora Akma, and today we're going to be covering the topic of dairy calves from weaning to four months of age. And I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Judd Heinrichs as our speaker for today's webinar. With a wealth of experience and expertise in heifer nutrition and management, Judd is known for his skill and knowledge both in the field and on the farm. <clears throat> Judd brings years of experience to the dairy industry, graduating from Cornell University with a bachelor's in science and animal science, and from the Ohio State University with a master's and PhD in dairy science. Now a professor emeritus of dairy science at Penn State University, he has worked in the areas of dairy nutrition and management, particularly with forages. From 1991 to 1992, he oversaw the National Dairy Heifer Evaluation Project. Judd's passion for research and data is evident through his involvement in, the da in dairy research. He has offered, authored over 135 scientific journal articles and book chapters along with extension publications. He has worked on numerous population studies of growth rates in dairy heifers and helped revise the weight tape, which is a tool used worldwide in heifer rearing. A decorated dairy professional, Judd has been spending his recent days consulting, writing, and lecturing. We're honored to have Judd here with us to share his insights, and I'm certain that his expertise will enrich our discussion and provide invaluable takeaways for all participants on managing heifers from weaning to four months of age. So welcome, Dr. Heinrich, and take it away. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. All right. Uh, well, good evening, everyone, and uh, I really appreciate being invited to to talk to you, and hopefully we'll have um, have some good things here that I can point out to you. Um, uh, tonight's uh, topic is on the transition from the baby calf to the heifer. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a little bit on the baby calf uh, to get that transition because uh, really, a lot of what happens with the transition uh, time period in, in the calf relies on how well that calf was set up prior to you moving them over to that transition pen. So I'll review a couple things here, and I'll try to go pretty fast in this because uh, it should be a review. Uh, the calf starts as, off as a monogastric. It, it relies on milk or milk replacer. Uh, but they need to turn into a ruminant by weaning time. Calves are born with an undeveloped rumen, and we know the rumen fermentation products, uh, primarily from concentrates, drive rumen development. And that's what I'll show you a little bit more here in a minute. Uh, the GI tract of the calf starts off this way, and we have this, this rumen here, which is very undeveloped. Uh, but yet that's a part that has to be developed by the time that calf hits that transition uh, group. Uh, and it, it needs to, you know, what, this is a calf in a transition group. I, I couldn't find one that was exactly uh, a, a full rumen that was uh, uh, right at eight weeks or, or, or thereabouts. Uh, this one's a little bit older. This is a calf that is basically at the end of the transition time period. But I, I thought it's a good one to show you. Uh, here's what it starts off with at birth, the rumen. Uh, and here's what it is when she's finished that transition pen. I, I usually figure, as I'll tell you, the transition pen is, is two to four weeks. Uh, and this gets you right up there to about 12 weeks of age. So it, it's a, a huge organ at that point in time and uh, very well developed. Uh, and the development, a lot of it are these papillae which, which line it and they're lined with capillaries that absorb all the nutrients that are produced in the rumen. Uh, this is the one feature of a ruminant that makes a cow a cow. It, it allows these animals to produce 
their body weight in milk fat and their body weight in milk protein every year. It's pretty remarkable. Now, a couple of things on rumen fermentation and products, just to define a, a few more of these things on rumen development a bit. Uh, when, when a ruminant animal makes VFAs, it's got grain and forage, it makes acetic acid that gets absorbed in the portal blood system. The cow uses it for milk fat uh, and milk production. Ca the calf and heifer uses it for growth. When she digests feeds, a variety of different feeds and makes propionic acid, they also get absorbed in the portal blood system used for, for energy, for growth and production. Now, the, the critical part of this is that when that young calf and even up in the transition time period that we're talking about makes acetic and propionic acid, these go in the blood system, they go to the liver, they get transformed into energy, uh, these ketones, and every cell in the body of the, the growing calf and transition heifer and cow um, compete for those. But when she makes butyric acid, it's kind of interesting. Uh, butyric acid is really an energy supply for the rumen. Uh, you'll never find it in the blood because if there is extra that the, the cells in the rumen can't use, it, it's converted to a, a compound called beta-hydroxybutyrate, uh, which actually helps in milk fat production. But anyway, back in 1979, so it's not that terribly long ago, uh, someone actually showed, uh, they, they did the research to show where butyrate, which could come all the way down here in its normal pathway to make beta-hydroxybutyrate that I just mentioned. Uh, but this ketone also has a way that it gets absorbed into the cells uh, lining the rumen wall. And it's very unique for those cells in the rumen epithelial tissue and it gets converted to energy there. So when that young calf and that transition calf makes butyric acid, the rumen has exclusive use of that energy as, as much as it wants. And that's why that butyric acid has such a huge fast impact on the development of the rumen in the pre-weaned calf and the transition calf. And this is just to show you a, a, a different way of looking at some rumen papillae, uh, but these were transition calves or calves right at the, at the time of transition uh, that weren't eating a whole lot of grain. Um, and and, and our, our, in, in this particular study, they were getting less than two pounds of grain a day at the point of, of being in the transition pen, which means before weaning, they probably weren't even getting half a pound of grain. Uh, very little papillae development. Uh, and these were calves that were getting more than two pounds a day. Uh, and, and these are the same uh, tissues here that are down here and they're just so much more elongated. It's really easy to see where you have so much more area for absorption uh, of, of nutrients when you've got this developed papillae. But this is this is what we have to have. Now, for the transition calf, once they have normal papillae and once they have this, this rumen that, that is, is capable of absorbing it, uh, they're starting to grow a huge population of microbial protein or microbial bacteria and, and protozoa, which make protein and their protein is about 50%, plus or minus a few, uh, a crude protein. Has a very high biological value, which means the amino acid composition of those bacteria and protozoa that she's producing in, in a rumen in that transition calf is, is what she needs for growth. Uh, so it is a key thing. We can't go ahead and supply it with with very many nutrients that's gonna anywhere come as, as, as close in biological value as these microbial protein. And of course, when, when, they're, when they're growing and making microbial protein, they also produce VFAs, which are very efficient 
uh, glucose pr producers in, in that transition, transition calf. Now I want to show you some slides. Once in a while when I do extension meetings, I, I, I get, uh, get someone to, uh, to grow some calves for me. Uh, and these are calves of six weeks of age. They, they were in, in a series of meetings I did in Wisconsin a couple of years ago. Uh, and this calf was six weeks of age, fed all milk. Uh, and that was all it was getting was milk. And, and this is the rumen of it. Uh, I've got a slide that shows you a little closer. Uh, and, and you see it's pretty smooth. There's a little bit of papillae development there, not a whole lot. This is a calf that was on milk and grain. Uh, externally, they look the same. Internally, very different. And, and you can see this one already has some pretty well-developed papillae. And these calves were right around five, six weeks of age uh, when they, they sacrificed them for this meeting. Uh, that, was, that was back when, when someone was willing to give me up some bull calves to do this. Uh, then you have the calf that you feed milk and some there are grain, well, first of all, they're fed milk, grain, and some forage. And these are always a problem uh, because some calves happen to like the grain a lot and they look like the previous one. Some calves don't like it as much and they like the forage better. Some calves don't eat any grain. And so they're kind of pretty varied. Uh, this one is somewhat in between. It's got some papillae development. So, so this calf was eating some grain, uh, but also had forage and, and you, know, you can see some pieces of forage in there. Okay, um, now what's the significance of, of this grain right at the beginning of transition? Uh, I was involved in a, in a great big field study that we did in Pennsylvania a, a bunch of years ago. And, and in, in 2011, uh, we published the first lactation milk production data from this, uh, but it was kind of interesting. We we followed baby calves from birth uh, really closely up through the transition pen area, and then followed them kind of a little less close, uh, just because of the logistics of it, uh, from four months of age on through calving. But then we kept track of first lactation milk production. And the interesting thing that we found is one of the strongest correlations on what happens with that baby calf that affects milk production and milk fat and milk protein was weaning dry matter intake, which is grain. Now, a few of these farms were feeding grain and forage, so it's not 100% grain, but it, it's primarily grain. But the, the amount of grain that that calf gets at weaning time as it's moving from the individual pen to the transition pen has a huge impact. Uh, sickness was the other big one and that's no surprise to anyone. You know, every day that calf is sick, she loses milk production, but that's, we're, we're not gonna get into that. Okay, uh, so about that time, um, and there was a, a study that had a, a lot of press from Cornell uh, where they fed calves, uh, fed, the calves were all fed a high level of milk replacer. It was a retrospective study. So they, they looked at uh, the, the Cornell dairy herd and, and one other herd uh, and over, over a long time period like two years, uh, and all the calves were fed the same amount of the same milk replacers, but it was a high level. Uh, they also fed grain. They didn't report intakes, so you can't get it quite as much out of this study as you'd like, but there's still a lot there. Um, and what they showed was that calves that grew faster made more milk in their first lactation. Uh, and this study got a lot of people excited and said, wow, we, we've got to get our calves growing faster at that end of the milk feeding and the transition period uh, because it's going to have an effect on first lactation. This, this study was done in 2012. Uh, then shortly after that, there was a big study in Minnesota where they had about uh, what you had 2,880 calves, it's up on the slide, 
uh, where they fed what I would consider more of a traditional amount of milk replacer. The Cornell one was high level. This one was was traditional. It was five to six quarts a day, uh, depending on what part of the study, because again, this one went over several years. This one, they had also Kef starter ad lib. Um, and, and what they were able to show directly was that uh, which of these had a significant effect on milk, milk fat, and milk protein. Uh, and the, the, the replacer amount, none, uh, the Kef starter had a significant effect. So just like the Cornell study where, um, I mean, since all the calves got fed the same milk replacer in both of these studies, it was a starter intake that made the difference. Uh, the, those calves that ate more starter, something else was going on there. Um, and this is just a, a scatter plot of all the data from the uh, Minnesota uh, study. And if you look at that regression line, yes, it does go up that these calves that grew faster in general make more milk in their first lactation. It, it's not a direct, you know, it's not absolute whatever, because you've got genetics and you've got a lot of other things involved in there, but these calves with a well-developed rumen uh, because of grain intake, it, it has an impact that affects long-term. Now, the last one, because I, so I don't belabor this too much, uh, both of those sets of studies got a lot of universities excited about it. And so there was a, a bunch of studies where they looked at a low and a high level of milk replacer or milk uh, feeding along with, with free choice grain. Um, and it turns out there were nine different studies that were published mainly from the US, but from around the world. Uh, and what they showed um, was that for every... 0.2 pounds of gain during the pre-weaning period gave 150 or 331 pounds of milk in the first lactation. And that's really similar to what the, the Cornell study and the, and, the, and the Minnesota study showed in terms of, of pounds. Uh, so yeah, it had an impact. The, the interesting part of this one though was is that by doing a meta-analysis, you could figure out a lot of other stuff uh, and one thing to point out with this before you get too excited, because I, I can get excited about this, was that 2.3% uh, of the first lactation milk production, uh, you could statistically come back and say had something to do with average daily gain around the time of weaning. 98% was other things. So the, the long and the short of it, it, it maybe isn't that big a deal, but it still is significant. Uh, so we have to hang our hats on it. Um, the, that particular study, again, being a meta-analysis of all these studies could pull out a lot of other stuff. And they showed that the, the increase in average daily gain from either milk or milk replacer, because there was a combination, accounted for about 20% of that uh, additional first lactation milk. The gains that came from grain feeding was 80%. Uh, so again, the, all of these things add up to grain feeding, rumen development is a big deal and it fits in with, with the transition calf really well. Uh, we have to remember that that young calf can only eat so much. So there's this uh, inverse correlation between milk or milk replacer intake and starter dry matter intake. And that's real and we, we've all dealt with that. And uh, you know, th there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, one of the things that's happening during this time period, right around the transition uh, calf time period is that the calf's liver is starting to, uh, early on it was using lactose to make glucose. Uh, milk sugar got converted to glucose. Uh, the glucose gets used by all the cells in the body of that growing calf, uh, but it, it changes over to using acetic and propionic acids ketones to making glucose. And that is a change in the liver that does take time. 
It doesn't happen overnight. Um, it, it actually is a pretty major change in the metabolism of the liver. Uh, it does result in an in a extremely efficient animal. Uh, it's, it's why our, our cows can produce what they do. Uh, it's why that transition heifer can grow so fast. In fact, they probably should be able to grow faster than your pre-weaned calves. And in, in most farms that I work with, that yeah, the, those transition calves, if they're done right, they take off really fast compared to, to pre-weaning. And a, a lot of it is the fact that the liver is extremely efficient at taking acetic and propionic acid and making glucose. Okay, so that transition is pretty important. Now I'm saying newly weaned calves, eight weeks. Um, I fully understand that there are a hundred, if not maybe even a thousand different ways to feed a calf. Uh, if you, you know, of, of all the people listening tonight, I'm sure every one of you has a different way of feeding, maybe a different age at weaning, a different everything. Uh, so I'm just saying eight weeks. It's, it's about eight weeks. Uh, some people will wean at six, some people will wean at 10 or, or even later. Um, but um, what, what I always like to recommend, and I think most people do, is leave them in that calf housing environment for a few days, maybe even a week, uh, after they've been weaned so they can get adjusted to life without milk. Uh, but then they need to go into a pen. Uh, and traditionally, and, and I've seen this so many times, four to eight calves per group works the best. Um, there, there's very limited, unfortunately, data on that. There is some uh, that, that just shows that a small group is good. If you were, if, if you happen to have group fed calves, which is one of those thousand different ways to feed a calf, uh, they probably are already adapted to many of the things that this first grouping would have to take place. Uh, but the adaption doesn't take more than three to five days, uh, but that would make a, a slight difference maybe on how long you kept them in a transition group if, if they were already group fed. Uh, in, in many cases, and I'm, I'm looking at the people that are, that are feeding uh, the, the 85 or whatever percent that, that have calves individually housed, uh, it becomes their first group feeding situation. Uh, so it adds some stress to calves. So what we want to make sure is that we have adequate feed bunk space. They're not used to competition. And so if we create lots of feed bunk space, and I'm talking 18 to 24 inches per animal, uh, then there isn't a, a problem with competition. Um, and, and that does make a big difference. Uh, the other thing you want to be careful with is a water is easy. And I purposely picked this one because this is not a good picture of a water. Uh, you've got a calf that's been used to an open bucket of water in their calf pen, most likely. And now all of a sudden I throw her in here and, and that's part of the reason I took this picture. And th this is one of those waters where the calf has to push that ball out of the way. Uh, yes, it has a feature for the winter time, I understand, but push the ball out of the way in order to drink. Well, that isn't something that she innately knows how to do. Um, quite often they'll figure it out, but you know, it might take four or five days. Uh, and if you've got a short time period in there, that could make all the world of difference of some calves not getting much grain and not doing well. Just something as simple as this, uh, that the water has to be easy to drink. I want good ventilation in there. They've probably been in a calf housing situation where they had great ventilation. Last thing I want to do is throw them into some place that's going to create, uh, a, has a lot of stale air. Um, and, and causes some, some issues with respiratory disease. Uh, two to four weeks in that newly weaned pen. So that's really the whole time period of this transition is, is two to four weeks. It, it's not a, a, whole, long, a whole long time. Um, 
And I, I think the, the feeding situation, as I'll talk about a little bit more, uh, that's one of the more critical things uh, because calves have preferences and we don't want, want their individual preferences to get in the way of them all growing the way we'd like. Okay, the, the fundamental part of feeding that transition calf is, is the grain. Uh, I purposely picked an odd grain that some of you might not, you know, see too much, although in Michigan, you're, you're going to see a lot of this, I think, which is whole grains in it, uh, which works for baby calves and works for a couple other groups after that. One of the key things that, um, depending on your nutritionist or who's setting up your diets, uh, we got to remember that the percent crude protein isn't the end of the story because calves eat grams of crude, have a requirement for grams of crude protein uh, and, and not percents. So if it's a palatable feed, we can feed a little more of it if it's lower in percent protein and we still get the, to the same place at the end of the day. So if your nutritionist wants you to feed a 24% a uh, and you're feeding a little less than someone else that's feeding a 20%, uh, the kids are probably getting the same grams of, of protein a day and it isn't going to have an impact. So that is one thing where it's, it's a little more difficult to make straightforward recommendations because uh, it's an amount and a percent that makes a difference. If we look at where the current NRC is, and they did a lot of work on, on the calf and heifer part uh, in the NRC, uh, I, I think the, the, the big thing to show you here, if you've got uh, maybe, maybe smaller breed animals or you're growing them a little slower, 20% uh, up until 250 pounds is okay. Uh, but if you're trying to grow them a little faster, this is probably gonna be more like 22. Uh, the interesting thing is by the time they get very far out of that transition pen, and, and these are just the numbers that NRC use because they have everything in, in kilos and I converted to pounds. That's why they're odd numbers here. But when they get up around 500 pounds, that protein uh, percent goes way down and, and the volume goes way down. So there is a big transition here which is extremely difficult to, to, to do that without making a couple big jumps in, in the diet. Um, it, it's on, on a management standpoint, it's kind of tough. What, what a lot of people do is they'll spend the first half to two thirds of the transition pen feeding calf starter because that's going to be up here in, in the higher protein. And then they'll make a switch over to a calf grower uh, so that by the time they those calves leave the transition pen, they're, they're down at at a, at a low, lower level of of protein. Uh, from weaning to four months, and most of the data, see, I'm I'm saying that they're they're two months of age about when they go into the the transition pen and and they stay there if if they stay there two months, so that'll take them up to four months. That, that is a pretty good time period to make a break. Uh, diets are based mainly on grain, four to five pounds a day. Uh, again, your nutritionist may have that up or down a little bit based on the percent protein. Uh, and you can put it easily in a TMR. Uh, lots of times it's a dry TMR, but it can be a wet TMR. And I'll show you some data in a few minutes where you know, it, a wet TMR works really well. Um, or component feeding, if, if you've got the time and the availability to do it. Uh, and what I mean by component feeding is you start off the morning with empty feed bunks and you put that five pounds of grain out there uh, in a manner that all the calves can eat. They all get their grain, they clean it up, and then you put forage in for the rest of the day. Uh, and the problem, if you just have grain in one side and just have uh, forage in the other side, 
is that no calves are going to be eating five pounds of grain and and two pounds of whatever forage you have or whatever you've got it calculated because calves have preferences and younger calves are the, the, really bad at having a lot of preferences. Some of them will eat only grain and they'll gorge out on seven or eight pounds of grain and they won't eat any forage. Other calves really like the forage and eh, they don't like the grain all that well. Uh, and so you get the, the flip side of that. So it is a little tougher. If, if you can get it in some sort of a dry TMR or component feeding, you can pretty much uh, dictate that all the calves are going to be getting what you want. It's kind of interesting, um, and I'll get into a little more of this in a few minutes, but calves uh, in this transition period eat to a maximum intake of three quarters of 1% of NDF as a percent of body weight. Uh, and and it's, it's kind of interesting how, how hard and fast that is, and it is something that your nutritionist is probably using. Um, the, the, the neat thing that's happening in this transition pen is you have a major expansion in rumen size, tissue density, and microbial population. Basically in that four weeks that she's in the transition area, she is markedly growing her rumen. And, and that's the whole thing that's going on here. And once she leaves this pen, uh, she can really handle a lot of different feeds and a lot of different forages. Uh, most often calves can handle a lot of different sizes. Um, I've seen calves go from four to six here to a group of 200 or 300, and they just do fine. Uh, they've gotten adapted to a little bit of competition. They understand world in a, in a group pen and, and it works just well. Uh, so total diet about 20% and then it's going to move down to 15%. Uh, we want to make sure there's some soluble protein in there. Uh, a lot of rumen degradable protein. It doesn't have to be real super high quality because I've got a rumen microbial population that needs to be able to utilize uh, that nitrogen and grow, uh, grow themselves and make high quality protein. Um, I didn't know where to stick this one, but watch body condition. Uh, that's one thing I'm, I'm constantly seeing fat calves and fat transition heifers and fat heifers up until about a year of age. Uh, that young calf, you know, we, we, we've modified our body condition score for all dairy animals in the last 15 years, 20 years. Uh, we used to think a heifer with a body score of four was, a, was just fine. Well, no. Uh, we, we want to keep that calf lean and growing. We don't want her fat. Uh, I don't want to see these tr transition calves ever get above a three, uh, because if they are, they're getting way over their, their allotted amount of grain, I, I suspect. Uh, forage for wean calves. Okay. After, after they've satisfied that, that amount of their dry matter intake that they're going to get from grain, and, and I, have to you have to limit it. Uh, now they're going to eat the rest is going to be is going to be forage, and it, it's hard to deal with it. But their their dry matter intake when they actually start that transition pen is 0.5 percent of body weight of NDF per day. By the time she leaves the transition pen, it's up to one percent, which is where she's going to stay all the while she's a heifer. And I'll show you some more stuff with this in just a minute here. Um, if you go back and look at the research on transition calves, uh, there's, a, a, there's been several studies, not a huge number, uh, showing that you can get, uh, there, there was a, a group in Ohio that did these studies a few years ago where they fed a dry TMR with 5, 9, or 15% grass hay. Uh, the rest of it would be, would be grains, and they all seem to work quite well. Uh, there wasn't anything hard and fast saying you had to have five, you had to have 15. Uh, going over 15 is a problem, however. That one has been shown, so you don't want to get too much. Uh, we did some work at, at, at Penn State uh, where we were put calves um, onto a, a dry TMR 
with 15% grass hay, because we based it off of those Ohio studies, uh, at eight, 10, or 12 weeks of age. So, you know, it, th this is, this is an, an early transition calf. This is a late transition calf or, or whatever, for whatever reason, we weren't feeding them a TMR. Uh, interesting, all the calves did just great at eight, 10, or 12. Uh, there isn't anything magic like we had to wait a month after they were in the transition time period before we could introduce that 15% grass hay. They did just fine back here. Uh, in fact, all the calves grew really well, some over two pounds a day, which is getting up on the high end of, of where I want to see it. Uh, we did some other studies where we fed alfalfa silage, and it was a good quality alfalfa silage or corn silage, again, a good fermentation, or dry grass hay, plus five pounds of grower. They, they got their, their grower every day and then basically had free choice haylage, corn silage, or grass hay. Uh, and, and here's this, this forage intake plot. They, they, they got their five pounds and then this was all added on top. They start off here at eight weeks in the beginning of the transition pen. At, at pretty low levels, they were somewhere between five and 10%. Uh, they, they liked the haylage in this study because it was just had a good fermentation. Uh, but they start off here, and, and this is ad lib, and, and see what happens here over a two month time period. It, it's pretty remarkable. They, they all of a sudden got up to 40% or more uh, of forage intake. So it, it's pretty varied, and this is why it's tough to make a TMR for all of these calves if you keep them two months into that transition pen, because the first group, if, if I fed 40% forage to that, to these calves, they wouldn't grow very well. They'd get real paunchy. They would, would simply not grow well, uh, but if I made it, a, a TMR that had 10% forage for these guys out here, I would have body condition score for calves. So uh, it, it is a tough one to do. Uh, that's why component feeding is, is a good way to do it or a, a TMR plus um, extra forage on there as long as it comes out in the beginning of the day again so that they, they eat their grain later on. They all really worked well. Um, they like corn silage, they like haylage, they like grass hay. Uh, back when I went to college, I was told calves couldn't eat fermented feeds. I'm not sure why they would say the VFAs weren't good, but then they produce VFAs in the rumen. So uh, calves can do just great on, for, on fermented feed. Um, th this gets back to a little bit of that NDF intake as I talked about. Uh, and and just look at the alfalfa haylage and grass hay calves here mainly, uh, is that um, they start off and eat about 0.5% of their body weight in NDF per day. By the time they leave this transition pen, in this case at, at 16 weeks, they were up to almost 1%. Uh, within a few couple more weeks, they would be up at 1%. And interestingly, they stay at 1% most of the time that they're a heifer. Uh, so it, it's kind of odd. Uh, corn silage intake leveled off here, but energy wise, because it's corn silage, uh, the energy was coming in there. Um, one thing you, you sometimes will find if it's a good quality haylage, they eat it faster, they like it better. Uh, the smell, the texture, it's easier to chew and to swallow. Uh, grass hay will often lag a little bit behind and that's mainly because it's a dry, long forage and it's a little tougher to eat, uh, but it's no big deal. They all work well. Um, now, what do you do with a few of those transition calves that didn't eat a lot of grain before weaning? Um, and that's why the whole, the whole calf feeding program and, and keeping track of what's going on is pretty important, but sometimes uh, people can't do that or they don't have the right software in their in their group housing pen or they just don't follow it in their hutches. 
Uh, but what do you do when these calves don't eat a whole lot at weaning? Well, weaning's happening. Uh, they're larger animals and they want to eat a lot of grain and they do eat a lot of grain uh, and that grain gets in the rumen. It produces acid, but they don't have the papillae there to absorb that acid. And so we have calves with acidosis. Classically, if you have transition calves that one day they're eating a lot of grain, the next day they back off, the third day they're eating a lot of grain, the next day they back off, probably means you've had some calves that just didn't have good rumen development. They have acidosis that day in between. That's why they don't wanna eat grain. Um, acidosis in a calf is not like a cow. It's uh, in, in the calf, it's defined as anorexic, lethargic, maybe diarrhea, abdominal discomfort. Uh, if, if you see some of those things and you see this up and down in intake, uh, then you need to go back up and look what's happening before the calves go into that transition pen. Uh, so a summary for growth for calves, uh, birth to weaning, somewhere, you know, 1.3 to 1.8 pounds per day is, is usually pretty good. That's over a long time period. And, and when you go birth to weaning that first couple of weeks, it's hard to get any average daily gain or very much the first couple. So when you stretch that out and utilize all that, it, it, it drops that down. Uh, post weaning, it's easy to get two pounds a day gain. In fact, uh, it's easy to get over that um, if, if you're not careful. Uh, and it's partially because of the rumen volume, uh, and it's partially because the liver is so efficient at utilizing ketones to make glucose. And she does a really good job of, of utilizing all that. One of the management things that I say for a transition calf that's really, really important to do is use a weight tape or a scale. And uh, I would prefer you have a scale, but if you don't, uh, you can use one of these calf weight tapes. They're better than the, 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 the general weight tapes because these were designed just for a calf. Weigh the calf. Uh, some people weigh them all at birth and, and at weaning. And um, I'm kind of on the fence on that. Just it, It's nice to have it. Uh, if you tell me you can only weigh calves two different times, uh, you, you won't put a weigh tape on a calf that third time, then I say uh, measure it at weaning and measure it one month later in that transition pen. Now, if you, if you get birth weight, that's that's good too. Uh, the, the issue is your birth weight is probably within three to five pounds on most of your calves unless they're a twin or a real preemie or something like that. Uh, but I want to look at this weaning weight in one month after. This is a transition pen. If that calf keeps on growing, and in fact, it may very well go faster, uh, and oftentimes will grow faster than it had. It'll be kind of a solid plane of, of growth here, and then boom, it takes off. Uh, that tells me you had, number one, a healthy calf. Uh, but for the standpoint of, of nutrition, you had a well-developed rumen. You couldn't get that otherwise. If you find calves that look like this, and it is common, I used to see a lot more common than I, than I do now, uh, but you'd see a calf that weigh the same at weaning as they do a month after. That tells me, okay, calf health could be compromised. Uh, so that's always a, a something to pay attention to. If they look like they're pretty healthy calves, then that tells me rumen development is the issue. It wasn't developed here. They're working on it here. And if you came in one month after that, they'd probably take off. But you lost a month of growth, which is hard to catch up. Uh, and then you get calves with really poor rumens. Uh, again, doesn't happen all that often, but I've seen it once in a while. And sometimes it's an individual calf that actually loses weight from the time of weaning to a month after. It's because they just didn't have the, the, the rumen well-developed. These calves are almost always unhealthy and it, it's usually an issue of which one came first. The fact that she wasn't eating uh, with a poor rumen and wasn't getting energy and protein 
and she became unhealthy or the other way around, uh, we, we don't know. But, but those are, that is a great time period to measure the calf to see if your transition pen's working. So to kind of summarize, um, diets based on four to five pounds of grain per day, uh, forage-based TMRs are great. Uh, it could be haylage, dry hay, corn silage. Uh, the key thing is, is you got to get that whatever amount of grain into those calves per day, because that's a lot of the protein, that's a lot of the energy, that's all the vitamins and minerals uh, that is so critically important. Um, I don't want the average of the pen to be getting five pounds. Uh, and some calves getting two and some calves getting seven. I want them all getting between 4.8 and 5.2, if possible. Um, so com component feeding ends up being a great way of doing it. Uh, we always want to reduce stress on these animals. Uh, yes, you're going to have some vaccinations. You're going to have some other management things, uh, but go easy on it. Don't stress them out until you feel that they're ready to take it. Uh, uh, I, I said before, good ventilation is important, but also keep the pens clean and dry. They've hopefully been used to a dry place to lay down all the while they were a young calf uh, and they need to continue that uh, because especially when you, when you look at the wintertime situations, this can have a huge uh, impact on whether that calf is going to have a, a good transition period or not. Um, Health-wise, uh, always look for coccidia. Uh, it's, it's an obvious one that happens here, especially when you're making a change in, in feeds and in grains that might have a different coccidia stat in it, uh, whether you're using a coccidia stat or, or an ionophore, they, they both work great. Uh, this time of year, pay attention to flies and some of these other problems that can be there that can really basically stress those young calves um, and create situations where they don't want to eat as much. Um, and, and always keep your, keep your ear out and, and your eye out for respiratory issues. Check the eyes, check the, check the nose, um, all those things that, that we've learned in terms of, of how to check health on, on those young baby calves. Um, so with that, I, I think I will will stop. Maybe went a little faster than I meant to, but uh, only three minutes faster on my watch. So we'll see if you want to go to any questions. There we go. Let me turn on my microphone. Okay. Um, thank you so so much. I I was taking notes as you were going through, and I was like, "Yep, there's definitely a few things that I." I did not learn um, in my time. So incredibly informative. And I really liked how you brought in all of the different studies that um, I don't want to say contradict one another, but just add more and more details once we start figuring out, especially with a meta analysis of, yeah, it only accounts for 2%. <laughs> and, and the rest is all of these other factors that, you know, we, we see sometimes in research where there are so many, so many of these different pieces to the puzzle. And we always talk about how can we continue to just keep inching that uh, benchmark forward. And that's one of them where it's, hey, if we can set these uh, calves up to become superstars in the parlor, you know, one of the ways to do it is make sure that they get calf starter in front of them and that it is enticing enough that they want to continue eating it. Um, and so with that, I do have a question. So um, with rumen development, is it, um, I almost, I, I think of it as the, the starter grain is kind of, and and please correct me because this is this is the question that I have is is the starter grain the catalyst for the papillae to develop, or is it a different thing? That it's it's the starter grain. It's it's starch. Okay. A little, yeah. bit of, a little bit of molasses, which does about the same thing. But no starch 
the, the breakdown of starch is propionic and butyric acid and, and butyric acid is, is what drives the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. So, so starter is, is the key thing. Uh, and, and back, uh, when I was early on in extension, I made this big kick about let's quit the forage guys. Let's only <laughs> feed starter. Uh, and, and it, it does work if you've got the right starter, but if you have a pelleted starter, it doesn't, you need to get a little forage in there. Right. But I mean, it, it really is, is the starch. Um, but, but to your, to your, your first point there, I'd find it interesting that all those calf studies showed the same thing. Mm -hmm. They all showed that starter intake grew faster calves and faster calves had all positive things. There's nothing negative about getting extra starter intake um, and getting a little extra growth. Maybe, maybe the only negative thing is it costs you a little more money, but hey, starter. Right. Yeah, not the end of the earth. <laughs> yeah. And I, from my my work and, and talking with folks, it's um some folks get really excited where they're saying, Hey, we're introducing, we're introducing hay to our calves and, and we're starting it off really early. And I start digging into, well, are they actually eating it? Are they interested in it? Are you seeing where, how you talked about that, you know, calves can only eat so much. And so we're going to have a difference in, in milk consumption or grain consumption once hay gets in there. And we all know hay is fed and you make hay bellies <laughs> and you don't you don't want that in a calf. You want them to have those nutrients to grow because they are growing, they can grow very quickly. And unfortunately, we've had a history of underfeeding these calves. And so now it's, well, how do we adequately, adequately feed them, get them the nutrients through that, through both milk and starter grain. And I know with, um, like dairy calf and heifer association and also some uh, like the farm program, they're all saying get starter in front of those calves as soon as possible. And, you know, of course it be in small quantities at first because calves aren't going to just start going hungry for it right away. But it's really interesting how I've seen it when it's very well done um, that calves are just, flying through the starter grain and and um and it really helps too when having uh that same starter grain when they get into that transition pen and like how you talked about a little bit with the component feeding almost i've seen um a number of people use it as a top dress where they're saying hey this is a transition we want them to get on the tmr but we also know it's a big shift so use that grain as a top dress and that'll then get them interested in the TMR that they, that, uh, is under it. So, um, we do have a question that came in. Uh, it is what age do you recommend maxing calves out on milk in order to maximize starter intake? Ah, in, in a perfect world, I'd say max out a calf about three to four weeks. And, you know, if, if, if you wanted my perfect, you know, if, if, what my one of a hundred different ways of feeding calves is at basically add little bit of milk, all they can get to three mm -hmm. to four weeks and then start dropping them down. Cause what the, the, the tough thing is it takes three to four weeks to really grow the rumen before mm -hmm. you can transition that calf. So they, they have to be eating grain and the only way to do it uh, is to cut down on the milk. But again, the bigger the calf is because it ate more milk early on, the the more she's going to be able to eat. Right. So it's this tightrope you can walk up. But, you know, people that, that get lots of intake and big calves usually have some sort of a system where they're, they're walking those calves down in milk intake with enough time that they're going to get room and development before they transition them. Right. Yeah. And I've, um, even though th this is a shorter period, what I'm thinking of, but with folks who are weaning calves, um, they, how I've seen it where those calves do better, um, in the sense of 
not, not, I'm not seeing stressor signs in these calves as much as I do in calves, um, that, uh, have like really abrupt weanings or very short weaning periods. So the folks that, uh, do like a, a 10 day or even a two week, I've seen, I've seen both systems, um, and they do almost a step down where we're adjusting that calf. We're making sure that, um, if we're bringing down milk, she's getting adequate starter where it kind of balances that. Um, but also all of these calves are still getting a ton of water with it too, to just maintain that fluid consumption. So, um, I've seen those really good systems put in place and yeah, it's, it's definitely, if you're making a shift for a management change, uh, it's definitely something where it's going to take a little bit, uh, because all of a sudden, if, if you go directly from a hard weaning of, all right, it's this group of weaning this week and everybody just abruptly stops and, and then the calves are not happy, um, but even very short periods of, Hey, for four days, these calves are only going to get one feeding of milk and, and then you swap it with water. Uh, that's, that's too much of a shock to the system where they don't have time to adjust, especially if then you go move those animals and put them in a group. And, um, right. yeah, uh, yeah. you talk a lot about with, um, or you mentioned, you know, reducing stress and also, uh, when you're grouping calves, start off on the smaller sizes and try to not move those calves right away when you're weaning all of that. I mean, all of that really adds up to major stressors for that calf because that's all that calf knows. And that that's something where I've worked with managers and calf care teams where, Hey, I understand that this is a, whether it you know, moving calves might not be an everyday thing for you, or it might be an every week thing for you. But for each batch of calves, this is the first time they're going through this. And so you have to be cognizant of that when you're moving these calves, when also you're setting up care protocols. And you have to think that these are still babies. They are still very much babies, no matter how heavy they weigh. Um, they're still very early in their development. And so making sure that we prime them as much as possible, but also not pushing them too hard or exposing them to too many stressors uh, early on where they then may get sick or not gain weight like how you were showing. Um, um, just thinking of all of these little things where Going back to that, hey, this this might only have a 2% effect. Well, come to find out that 2% can't add up quickly if it's a 2% on top of another 2% on top of another 2%. So. Um, so we are getting to the end of the hour. And if um, I would appreciate it if anybody who is attending live or uh, watching the recording in the future to please... Uh, scan the QR code and uh, take the post-session survey. Let me see if I can pull um, the link for everybody. All right, you should be able to have that. So the link is the uh, link to the survey is the first thing in the chat. And then if you wish to access uh, the YouTube playlist where all of these recordings are housed along with the podcast where we are pulling the audio from these. And then also the Michigan State University Extension Dairy page where you can follow up on what the program is doing and other, any other uh, articles and research that's coming out from the team as, uh, as well as um, some of the professors who are working with an extension as well. So I want to do one final call out for any uh, questions before we wrap things up. You know, I guess as, as a final thought, yeah. uh, 
one, one thing I I did omit saying and, and didn't have it in my slides, but I'm assuming when you wean these calves and move them in the transition group, that they all came from the this they all came from the same situation and are going in the same situation. It's not that you're pulling out two calves today and put them into a transition right. group and two calves next week or whatever. They they all need to start off that transition group at the same time and stay there for whatever time period fits your management. Right. Yeah. We. Um... The presenter last week covered a little bit of that where they said ideally no more than a week's worth an age apart uh, just because growth rates and competitions can vary quite quickly um, right. if you start getting outside of that. So um, no further questions have come in. So once again, thank you everybody so much for joining us this evening and for listening in. Uh, we appreciate your questions that you asked and uh, join us next week for our final session with Bethany Datosen from Vita Plus, who's going to be talking about uh, managing heat stress calves. So thank you, Dr. Heinrichs, and we really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome.